My name is Dick Heiner. I was an Air Force captain, and I was a deputy chief of the uh, American Forces Thailand Network from 1969 until 1970. I was the uh, chief for a couple of months until uh, uh, they brought in a lieutenant colonel, and then I was a deputy chief until uh, 1970. We worked uh, six days a week, and we always looked forward to having Sunday off. Um, and it, the days went by really quickly. Uh, because there was so much to do. On Sundays was really interesting because we would go out into the uh, hinterlands. We had a, a gentleman that worked for us by the name of Saad. That's S-O-D. He was a Thai national and he loved taking us on tours. And so we would go with Saad uh, uh, out into the countryside and visit villages and meet the people and, and that sort of thing. So he was a big help to us and a very, very friendly guy. And the thing about AFRTS, it's much different than commercial broadcasting because in AFRTS you get to really expand your, 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 yourself. Uh, you can do, uh, within guidelines of course, you can do just about whatever you wanted to do. You can experiment with uh, different shows, uh, with different music. Uh, you can be creative uh, to the point where you can try things uh, that sometimes don't work out. Uh, in commercial broadcasting, you're, you know, you're, you're restricted. You have to stick to a script, uh, pretty much uh, the same playlist, and those kinds of things. So for a broadcaster, AFRTS is an absolutely perfect place to, uh, uh, to really expand yourself and to be creative. Uh, and so most of the uh, people, the broadcasters that came to us, realized that. Uh, some of them were uh, occasionally immature and they would go downtown and uh, have a little bit too much to drink and that sort of thing, but we could take care of that. Um, and, uh, but overall, uh, it was a great experience for, uh, for broadcasters to be over there. In those days in Thailand, we did not have videotape, uh, and so everything was live. And that, of course, put a little pressure on you to get it right the first time. And so we probably had more mistakes and that sort of thing uh, on the air than, uh, than you would today when you can pre-tape something. Uh, but it was uh, the, the uh, Air Force and the Department of Defense provided us with some pretty good equipment, uh, the state of the art of what was available at that time. But uh, again, videotape was uh, still in the, uh, in the future uh, for us, and so everything was pretty much live as far as television was concerned. And of course, we had the transcriptions from uh, uh, the Broadcast Center for, for radio, uh, but we were not able to record uh, any kind of television at that time. They were a hard-working group of people with pilots and support people at, uh, at Karat uh, all over the country. Uh, they appreciated us because we were the only link with home that they, that they actually had. Uh, and we would uh, survey them both officially and uh, informally in the clubs and that kind of thing and ask them what they were, what they were looking for and what kind of music they liked. Uh, and what kind of TV programs, and we tried to accommodate that as much as possible. But uh, we were uh, considered to be uh, uh, some of their favorite people on the base uh, because um, they knew what we did. And we would go into the clubs and people would buy us drinks and that sort of thing, uh, and so we were certainly appreciated there. Uh, the most horrendous experience that I'll never forget was the day that the uh, F-4 crashed into the station at Udorn. Um, that was... Uh, uh, certainly an unforgettable experience. Um, I was sitting at my desk, um, I just had lunch, and uh, Sergeant Ushold, who was the network superintendent, uh, came in and said, I had a call from uh, Master Sergeant Lynch from New Dorn, and something terrible has happened. So I pick up the phone, and uh, it was uh, Jack Lynch, uh, who said that an uh, airplane had flown through the front door of the uh, station at Udorn, and it was totally uh, in flames, and he had no idea uh, who was in there at the time. He had a pretty good idea, but he didn't know exactly who was there or who had gotten out, and he didn't know who was off duty uh, and who had gone r to run an errand or something like that. And he would call me back as soon as he discovered uh, who, uh, what the, what the uh, extent of the casualties were. Um, Sergeant Ushol and I got together at that time, and. Uh, uh, I called uh, 13th Air Force, uh, uh, Chief Master Sergeant Bradley over at 13th Air Force and informed him. Uh, Bradley is uh, a guy who recorded all of the telephone conversations that uh, he got at uh, 13th Air Force and he still, I think he had the tape, I don't know what he did with it, but uh, he was not aware that this had happened. 
Uh, and then uh, we called in uh, our people and put, uh, put a staff together. Uh, T.J. Davis, uh, uh, Sergeant T.J. Davis was uh, on our staff and uh, he went out and came back and indicated that uh, he had found an airplane. Uh, for us to go up and pick up the survivors and also to go to Tok Lee to pick up a radio transmitter to take to Udorn to try to get back on the air because Sergeant Ushol and I felt that it was mandatory for everybody's uh, uh, psychological uh, uh, health to get that station on the air just as soon as possible, get it back on the air. And so uh, Davis showed up with a C-47 out at the flight line. It had no markings on it. The pal pilots were in civilian clothes, and I asked TJ, I said, where'd you get this airplane? He said, don't ask. Uh, so I didn't. Uh, and that airplane uh, was our, at our disposal for almost a week. Uh, it not only ferried equipment around and brought the survivors down uh, uh, from uh, Udorn, but also uh, uh, transported us to Udorn for the uh, uh, memorial service that we had uh, a couple of days later. Uh, we brought the survivors down after we determined who had not been in the building and uh, we set up uh, a studio in the Karat Studios, a radio studio for them to operate uh, out of uh, Karat uh, to provide, continue to provide service to Udorn. Of course the transmitter we had installed up there uh, after the tragedy and they were on the air within 24 hours uh, transmitting from uh, uh, their, their radio programs from, uh, uh, from Karat. Uh, and so uh, that was probably the most memorable experience that I had. I think for the broadcasters, um, for one, I think that had we just let them sit in their barracks for uh, several days uh, and think about what happened and to think about this could have been me, uh, that certainly wasn't healthy for them to do that. Uh, so we wanted to get them down, keep them busy. And the remarkable thing about those uh, those uh, broadcasters that came down was the fact that they went on the air and they were absolutely totally professional. Uh, they acted as if nothing had happened, uh, that it was just any other day, and that I'll never forget. Uh, so one of the things that, that uh, how it affected me was uh, I had planned to get out of the uh, Air Force uh, at the end of my tour. That would have only been like six weeks. Um, uh, before, after that happened and uh, I was going back to the University of Oklahoma to get a PhD uh, and I had my papers in and I decided to pull them and stay in the Air Force because of the fact that I just can't leave um, these these people uh, and I mean just it was just absolutely magnificent and so uh, I stayed in as a result of that uh, of that tragedy. Every April 10th I go back to the Vietnam Memorial Wall uh, and, uh, and, and visit them so that's something I, I look forward to. April 10th was the day of the disaster uh, in 1970. And uh, every April 10th, uh, Sergeant Ushold uh, would call me, no matter where I was in the world or in the country, every, every April 10th, and we would talk about this. And he did that for, uh, gosh, almost 20 years. He would call me every April 10th. And then uh, after the Vietnam Wall was, uh, was built and their names were put on the wall, uh, I decided to go down there every April 10th uh, just to uh, pay my respects. And I was down there this last April 10th and uh, it was a very moving experience um, just to be there. Um, there was a, a veteran, obviously a veteran, uh, who was in uh, red, red, white and blue suspenders. Uh, who had climbed up on a ladder and was helping people rub the names uh, onto paper uh, uh, from their, their loved ones. And so it's a moving experience. Everybody should go down there uh, any time that they can. But April 10th is a special day for me to go down.